following program on Ada Verna 24 is classified for general audience. It is intended for all ages. It contains little or no violence, no strong language, and little or no sexual dialogue or situations. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. Good evening and you're joining us on another episode on Gen XYZ and this is a program where we talk about topics or issues mainly based on the youth in this pertaining time. Now, April has just begun and if most of you all may be or may not be knowing that this month is allocated to the awareness of autism. So now this condition is probably a, not a very popular a uh, topic that most of us would be talking about but there are children there are people who are diagnosed with this and it's important that we as a layman we as parents or teachers or friends and family that we are aware about this uh, syndrome and also how we can deal with people so now uh, world uh, awareness of autism day was allocated on the 2nd of april and uh, the ministry of health College of Pediatricians and the Family of the Health Bureau has come up with a program in order to spread the awareness of this as well. Now to talk about this, I would like to invite uh, Professor Jonathan Green, who is a professor in child and adolescent psychiatry from the University of Manchester, and also Dr. Cathy Ledbetter, who is also the research fellow from University of Manchester, and both of them are here from the United Kingdom. And then we have Mrs. Malati Kahandalienage, who is a parent advocate and advisor. And finally, Dr. Dilini Vipula Guna, who is a consultant community pediatrician. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know it's a really busy schedule for you all as well, but I'm glad that we're doing this program. I feel that this is going to be a very important program for all the parents and the youngsters as well. So now to start off our discussion, um, the definition of autism. Now, a lot of people don't know exactly what it means. They try to mix up the definition between Down syndrome, ADHD, uh, ADHD and also like the people, it's difficult for people to identify, okay, this child is diagnosed with something like autism. So what is the definition and how can you identify children who have this condition? Yeah, uh, thanks. So. The, the term autism is given to a variety of development in children which ultimately results from a difference in their brain development which probably first arises in the latter part of pregnancy, so before birth, as the brain develops in the uh, fetus in the before birth. And this difference in brain development takes the form that as these children grow, they experience the world in rather a different way. So their experience of, of light, dark objects, sensations is often rather different. Their experience of people is different. And as they grow, you start to see that manifest in the way they behave. Um, and the manifestation can have take different forms, but it, it all crystallizes around a number of different areas. So, as these babies grow from about a year of age, you can start to see differences in the way they interact with other people. Um, perhaps they're less confident or sometimes they uh, seem to be not so interested in other people immediately. Um, uh, and then they may react slightly differently to what you might expect with uh, everyday objects or sensations, light and dark, heat and cold, etc. Then as they go a bit older, um, we start to see uh, differences in the way they communicate with other people. So they may uh, not do the ordinary interaction quite so easily with other people when they're in conversation or interaction. They may start to behave a little differently, like in the second and third year. Uh, they may show some um, what look like unusual behavioral patterns. So they may do 
uh, lots of things repetitively, like jumping up and down or touching things repetitively. Um, uh, and they may play rather differently. So their play may take a form that is uh, rather more uh, repetitive and lining up things rather than uh, playing in a way that looks uh, more typical. So all these kinds of ways add together into a, uh, a recognizable pattern. By the time they're about two or three, where uh, we call this an autistic development. But it's important to recognize that autism isn't just a static thing. It's a way of developing, which is, um, has differences, but also similarities with um, everyday uh, child life. Uh, um, and it's understanding those differences and similarities that's important to when we support them. So we do have good ways of understanding and recognizing autism. From about a year of age, we can recognize children that look more likely to develop this condition. Uh, and we have particular ways of doing that. And by about three, uh, we are usually able to uh, recognize this form of development. But in some children, it's actually much later. So it doesn't actually manifest sometimes until later childhood or, or even adolescence when we recognize this autistic pattern. So, Professor, like identifying uh, at a later stage, do you think it's too late then to start treatment? Not at all. So one of the things we've learned is that although it's really good to start support and intervention early, uh, you can do that at any time and it's beneficial. Even in adulthood, there are many adults now who start to recognize that, wow, I'm autistic, I, I recognize that I'm autistic and it explains a lot about my childhood and my development. There are still many things that one can do then to help people feel more comfortable and more adapted into their lives. Okay, now, now coming back to the 2nd of April, the uh, national, the World's uh, Awareness Day for Autism. Tell me more about this program. What did you focus on? What was the motive behind this? Yeah, so um, thank you so much for inviting us today. Uh, so um, the, as you said, this month, whole month of April is kind of dedicated to um, celebrating, talking about, being with people and accepting people with autism. Um, so with that, we celebrate the World Autism Awareness Day on 2nd of April. So this time, actually, we um, had the opportunity to uh, collaborate with several partners, the Ministry of Health, the Family Health Bureau, and the College of Pediatricians. And we also had the opportunity to have some collaborators from University of Manchester, who actually are here to um, have a project called Namaste uh, to, to uplift the services for children in, with autism in Sri Lanka. So we, we use this opportunity to uh, have a kind of a initial meeting with the stakeholders in the Ministry of Health uh, and, and that program was quite success and that was followed by some knowledge sharing session uh, this time. At the same time, we this time launched a social media uh, campaign to, to, you know, get the public awareness, people to talk about autism and, and also to, you know, people to accept and understand people with autism. And, and part of it, I think, uh, was, was the light up of um, the Lotus Tower, which happened on 2nd of April. Uh, so um, I think uh, that, that, that's what we've been doing uh, for this uh, month. Uh, for the for the commemoration and and also to celebrate autism all right so now as you said uh, doctor i believe that a lot of people are not aware about this condition whatsoever and how to deal with the people who are having this condition per se and that's exactly what y'all are doing and what we are doing on this program itself so in this current day and time what are some of the problems that children who are having this condition facing at the moment because of the you know the fact that people are not very uh, comfortable around them or accepting this disease, what is the main trigger point to them? Do you want to go ahead? So, um, so the challenges, uh, you know, I, I'm talking in, in Sri Lankan context. Uh, so as Jonathan said, so we, we you know, mostly see uh, children when they have challenges in, you know, mostly the social communication, the way de they develop social interactions um, and, and certain behaviors and how they make sense of the world. 
Um, and this, this behavior, when we you know, go through the life cycle, uh, we see the, the children are having you know, difficulties in you know, integrating into the society sometimes, and as well, especially when they want to go for a preschool into the education system. So there are a lot of challenges we see in, in local you know, Sri Lankan context. Uh, not only for the child, but also for the parents, the community they live in, how difficult for them to you know, integrate, to receive support for all these difficulties. Because uh, as, a, as a developing country, you know, we, we still are, we are not yet there to get optimal services for all the children. We have issues with the trained staff, specialized staff, uh, you know, necessary clinic services, uh, parental support services. So, so we have so many things, and and I think that's why we need more programs like this, so we can support our communities better. All right, uh, doctor, if you could answer this question now, uh, Dr. Delini mentioned that you know we're still a developing country. It takes a lot of time for people to be accepting this kind, uh, the presence as well of autism here. Do you see a difference between the United Kingdom and Sri Lanka, the way we handle things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you and thanks for inviting us on today. Um, I mean, I think there are some similarities. Um, there are definitely similarities and I don't want to in any way pretend that we've got it all perfectly right in the UK because it's a long, long way from that. Um, I think over the years there has been a lot of work that's been done by charitable organisations, for example, to increase awareness of autism um, and within you know, our National Health Service as well. And I think because of that, within the, the general public, there is a reasonable level of understanding of autism. Um, I think there are still misunderstandings about it and there is definitely still, still some stigma there within the community. But I think over time that is reducing and people are becoming more understanding of autistic people and more accepting. And I think what's also happened perhaps over the past 10 years or so is because autism has, be, is, has been diagnosed for quite a long time now in the UK, we now have quite a lot of autistic adults who are able to speak and share their experiences. And that has become very powerful because they're able to reflect on their childhood and themselves growing up and the impact that misunderstanding and prejudice um, and being excluded has had on themselves and you know how that's really impacted on their mental health and well-being so i think that sent a really strong message to our community and it continues to do so that actually we really need to reduce misunderstanding, we need to make sure people are being well understood, well supported, well included within the community and then th those autistic people will grow up to be much happier, have better quality of life and so on. Alright, so I think uh, we have a basic idea about what autism is and the current context uh, where we are in right now but uh, we need to get into more into detail because right now the main factor is how parents are going to deal with their children if they are being diagnosed and also the teachers also how are they going to deal with the kids uh, who are diagnosed with this disorder as well but and also uh, Mrs. Malathi we have to listen to your story as well you've been a strong woman throughout and I believe that everyone is waiting to hear your story as well but before that we have to go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon. You're watching Gen XYZ. Welcome back to Gen XYZ. Now in the first segment, we have been talking about the awareness of autism and I believe that uh, the professionals here gave a good idea about how we can identify uh, individuals who are diagnosed with this as well. Now to go into further detail, I think 
Mrs. Malathi, you have an interesting story that you need to share because the parents out there, some people might be lost. You know, they might not be knowing what to do with their child when they find out, okay, their child has this condition per se. What are they going to do? What are we going to do about their education? Are they going to have a problem with, you know, dealing with society per se? What can you share about your life? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, my son is 30 years now, so he has gone through a lot. So all the things that we discussed earlier, the stigma, education, all that has been there. But I'm very proud of him now because he's an independent young man. He's a chef. He travels by himself. So when I think of me and how did I do it, that is the question that you want to ask. I think he didn't change. My child didn't change, but I and my family his siblings had to change. We had to accept him the way he was. We couldn't change him the way we wanted him to. So I think the word autism has taught us, A is he has taught us to accept him. U, he has taught us to understand him. T, he has taught us to teach him. I, to include him. S, to support him. And M is to make it meaningful for him. So for me, I think that word as a family, that word has a lot of meaning. It's not just a word. Because of understanding the word autism has made us better people, has made us advocate for others, especially parents. Because I know if I can do it, you can do it. Not in the same way, but in the way that is meaningful for the child. So yes, Kesara was diagnosed uh, at the age of two and a half years, but not we didn't know the meaning of the word autism then. With his behaviours, he was like a little monkey and an animal, so that was the diagnosis. It was very hard. Learning that my child is going to be different was very difficult for us to understand initially. So that is the time we realised, OK, he has been given to us. He didn't come searching. We got him, so what are we going to do as a family? So I think that is where it started. Because Kesar is part of the family, we can't exclude him. So to include him, what did we have to do? Because he is who he is. He is with autism. So he can't change. So I think that is the message I want to give to the parents mainly. For the child to change, yes, definitely the child will change in the end. We need to change. We need to include him, we need to accept him. And I think it's how you respond to the child. He never spoke till he was six years. But it didn't mean that we didn't speak to him. Though he didn't have language, he was able to communicate. And he started talking with the dogs first, before he even spoke to us. So, and then we realized, yeah, if he doesn't talk, it doesn't matter as long as he communicates, as long as he can tell that I am hungry. This is what I want to do. This is what I want to be. So when you take Kesri, he never played with toys. He would just observe. Then who am I to say, no, you, this is the way you have to play? Because he seems very happy watching others play. His only interest was water and fire. So yes, as the professor said, he had a lot of sensory issues. He didn't feel the heat. He didn't feel the cold. He would get uh, injured, but he wouldn't feel it. So he was hyper. On the other hand, he couldn't bear loud noises. So now we know the words, it's hypersensitive and hyposensitive. But at that time, we didn't know what it was. So if your child is only playing with water and fire, can I send him to a school? Before changing him to understand, you can't play with fire in school. You cannot keep open the tap the whole time. So before sending him to school, I had to make sure that he was ready to go to school. You know, so that is how we, we looked at it. It is how, so we, we had structured time. Okay, if you can play with water, only this time. So when he's playing with water, that is the time I taught him colors and everything through water. So playing with fire is, okay, only when I'm in the kitchen, you can come with me. You can start doing something with fire. So that way we are the ones who structured the environment. Otherwise, if you are just letting me be playing with fire and water the whole time, 
Yeah. So for me, that's what I want to tell the parents. It's not the child. Then he realized, okay, this is the time I can do this. This is the time I can do this. So then he also fell into a pattern. So and it was easy for us to manipulate our time also accordingly. So once the child understands the structure, then he's ready to go to a school. And if there's no structure at home, you can't expect the child to go and sit in the classroom for two hours. So I think that is where, that is where the parents need to understand. See, 40% the therapists or the professionals will do. 60 to 70% it has to be done at home to accept him and to include him, teach him, to support him. So Kesar is a young man now. He's quite happy. He's a chef. And again, the earlier workplace, he had to undergo some bad experiences, but it had made him stronger. It has made us stronger to advocate more for the rights of the people with autism. That's right. That's a very inspiring story, I must say. And for a parent to be this strong in order to not give up on their child, because nowadays I've come across a lot of people who, as soon as they get to know that their child is diagnosed with something, they instantly give up and they sometimes they even get depression. So the, it's the parent's responsibility for them to be strong at first in order to handle their child per se as well. So Mrs. Malati, like this happened, your child was diagnosed 28 years ago per se. Yes. And um, what was the level of acceptance at that time and how do you think people are handling it right now compared okay. to years ago? Yeah. I think there's only a very small shift of change has happened during the acceptance. Though people are aware of it because they don't know what to do. People, that, that is the other thing. They don't know how to interact with a person with autism. So for me, uh, with Kesra, I became a special educator just to teach him. So I think that is where I was so, Kesra was lucky and I was lucky to understand how to do things, certain things with him. Acceptance-wise, I think younger children are accepting, but it's the adults. I'm talking about preschool. They don't care whether the child is talking or walking or they like to play. How they play is not. But it's the parents. Okay, don't play with that child. You will. So that is where the society is the one that who puts the virus into the children's head. And then that is but how they grow up. So if they grow up making a, like, differentiation between you and me, so that's how they will grow up. And again, the acceptance comes with the religious background. It's your karma. So I think those are still, but now I think the younger generation is more aware. But even them, they don't know how to interact, like by watching Big Ben and all that, they are more aware of their people, like Stephen, who is socially. But I think I have come across a lot of young people, they say, we don't know how to. Not that we don't want to, but we don't know. So their expectation of how an autistic child will behave is because they have seen one or two kids or they have seen uh, Big Ben and think that everybody is behaving like that. Because we don't take our kids out that much, especially kids with uh, high behaviors. They don't because we don't know how to interact with them. If they are jumping, pulling and all that the parents don't take and we don't have places to take them. Because if you take a child with autism to a cinema, let's say, and if the child starts screaming, so you have to take the child out. So that is, I have done that. That is how I integrated Kesra. Would take him to place where the sisters are taking part. We'll sit at the end. Only when the sister is going on stage, we will go see, bring him back. So little doses at a time to give him that. So that there are so many ways of interacting with the children. There is no manual here. It's, in, it's interesting to hear what you've just said about the cinema, um, because I think that is quite a common problem yes. for lots of parents with autistic children. You know, where can we take them? What can we do? We can't just sit at home all the time. And a really brilliant initiative within the UK that's happened recently is there's kind of autism friendly screenings in some of the cinemas. Uh, so, yeah, so it's, yeah, yeah. it's 
um, the lights are up a little bit, it's not as loud and everyone there is very accepting if a child moves around, if they make a little bit of noise. So it's somewhere that families can go and just feel relaxed and, and watch a film together. And I think just, you know, it's not a big deal to do something like that. You know, it's quite a simple thing for cinemas to do, but it makes such a huge difference to families. And I think in picking up on this theme really informs the way that we do healthcare now or we, we wish to do healthcare. So that adaptation and understanding process is what we initiate from the beginning with new parents who have a neurodivergent or potentially autistic child. So we will want to help their awareness of the child's communication um, and understand what the child is trying to say. Because often, and you, I'm sure you'll remember this, it's, con it's perplexing. It's difficult, difficult to make sense, sense of what, of what the child's yeah. trying to tell you. And our programs now, what they do is try and help parents really make sense of their child's communication. And inevitably, by doing that, the parent then starts to, to respond in a more understanding way. It just happens naturally. And then after that, the child starts to respond because they are being understood and so they feel more comfortable and you start a, a kind of virtuous circle between the parent and the child and we think if we can start that from the earliest time uh, then it will um, help everything get off onto a good foot the parents will feel stronger, stronger. and more knowledgeable and empowered and like you, we'll be able to take the child into the community where we then have to look at community adaptations like these uh, cinema screenings and other areas of community. And it's through all those sequence of adaptations that the child actually then will grow up feeling more accepted and comfortable. And it's not to say that this is totally straightforward. I think you've no, been clear about is. that. It we want to say it's all easy and um, we use these video feedback techniques with parents early on to try and help them really understand their child. And we've shown that these work so that um, although it's not easy, actually one can make progress. And we've shown that the outcomes from doing this, when we look at the children when they get to middle, middle school, middle childhood, are much better, uh, significantly better if we start this early. Uh, and all parents can do this, actually. That's another thing we've shown, that um, you don't have to be an exceptional parent like you, you <laughs> probably are in some ways. I don't think so. You, you know, and you don't think so, but you, you don't have to be. Most parents can respond to this because they're motivated to understand their child because that's natural parenting. So if we just give them the tools, they will often do the job. As you said, 60 or 70 percent, they'll do the job. So. There's a lot of hope there, I think, in our modern techniques of uh, managing and understanding autism, that we can improve outcomes. It doesn't mean we make autism go away, because it's a difference that sustains, but it makes it much more comfortable and the outcome's much better for the child and the That's family. That's right. I feel that not just the parents, but also teachers also play an important role here as well. It starts from home, but then somewhere or the other, the child needs to be educated and they need to be sent to school. And it's that environment that matters to the child per se. So Dr. Didini, if you can share your ideas about the education system here in Sri Lanka for the children who are diagnosed with this uh, disorder, autism, and uh, the, the things that they have done in order to accept this, and what is the status right now? Okay, so uh, it's like this. Now, um, as you, you know, we, we say the most of our schools, what we call mainstream schools, you know, the following the curriculum. So when you have, a, you know, a child diagnosed with autism, um, you know, unfortunately, starting from preschool, I would say, uh, what we would really like, unless the child is having, you know, significant difficulties, we would like that child to be in more supported environment, going to school with, you know, a bit different but similar type of friends, same age children, enjoying the same things the others are doing, you know, learning probably in a little bit little bit of support but you know learning the same things and going for the same dreams probably so um, in in our education system we see there are a lot of challenges for our children and families 
starting from again preschool because we we have lack of you know inclusive preschools and you know uh, acceptability for children with autism there are a lot of challenges when it comes to uh, teachers the methods of education as well as the facilities we have and also uh, unfortunately when it comes to peers and acceptance from the community they are going to you know educational system so there are a lot of you know attitude change we expect from parents of other children the peers to understand their you know colleague or the other friend um, but at the same time one, one challenge we see is obviously compared to the UK system is um, our, our teacher is supposed to look after about 50 children you know we don't have much teacher assistance we don't have enough trained staff so it's it's a challenge for a country like us so we are trying to find that balance where you know we try as much as possible to adapt the environment for our children with autism or you know uh, neurodevelopmental disorders making sure that they get the best all right thank you dr delini now we have to go into a short commercial break we'll be back with our final segment as well you're watching gen xyz and we will be back soon Welcome back to Gen XYZ. We've reached our last segment as well. Now, before we wrap up, there is uh, a little bit of things that we need to share as well with the parents and the teachers who are watching this program as well in order to how to handle with the individuals who have been diagnosed with autism as well. Now, I would like to pose a question to uh, Dr. Cathy and uh, Professor Jonathan. Where do you think Sri Lanka needs to improve at this point, you know, uh, compared to the United Kingdom? Where do you think Sri Lanka is going wrong? Well, I don't think, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, point the finger and say you're going wrong. But I, I would say that one of the reasons that myself and Kathy are here um, this week uh, in Sri Lanka is that we've developed in the UK some methods of early intervention in the health system which um, the uh, UK government has uh, funded us to um, uh, offer to other countries in South Asia. And our Sri Lankan colleagues were very excited about, about this. And so we're here really to share our experience and expertise with our colleagues in Sri Lanka to see what might be most appropriate. It's really up to our colleagues in the community to um, know what's most appropriate. But we, what we can say is that um, over the course of our 20 years of work and development and research and thinking about what works, uh, we have come to a, a way of, of working with um, parents of young children with autism that we think is usefully the prime focus. And I talked about this a little bit before, but um, what we have from the scientific research that we've done is to show that uh, uh, working in the way I described and using these video feedback techniques to help parents understand their child early on really does have an effect and we didn't know this before we started it's like that's the beauty of doing research you can hope but you don't know until you actually do the the tests you know and the tests have come out very positively on this and it reinforces what you know from your experience and that's another beautiful thing when the science and the experience comes together that's always great and um, so the science tells us that if we put these kinds of interventions in um, the long-term outcome for the children is is improved in terms of their uh, happiness their well-being their functioning doesn't make them not autistic so we don't it, that's not the purpose. It's to improve the development given their difference. And, um, uh, you know, we found over time in a number of different trials that uh, this really does work and it helps parents feel more empowered, just like you're talking about, um, uh, to be the, the best parent they, they can be, which of course is what all parents want. So we just give the parents the skills really through the techniques that we've developed 
and they, do, they have proved successful. So what we're about here is saying, this is what we've done in the UK and also a bit in India. Um, how could we adapt this to your community, your environment, your health system, um, and to see whether this would work with you? And uh, we hope it would. We think the science suggests that it will. So that's why we're here. We're very excited about the collaboration over the next few years. Yeah. So, Kathy. Yeah, and like uh, Professor Jonathan says, I wouldn't want to be pointing the finger either. And I think what's really brilliant about this new project that we're running is that it's bringing together the expertise and the capacity from four different countries. And we've all got different strengths and we've all got different needs. You know, we've been doing some work in, in the UK, as Jonathan's described. Um, you know, we've been really impressed with the early childhood screening programme that's been developed and is implemented within Sri Lanka. You know, so all countries um, have their, the things that they're doing really well. And it's the same with our colleagues in India and Nepal as well. And this project is really bringing that together so we can all learn together because none of us, no, no country around the world is getting this completely right. You know, that, that's the truth of the matter. But we can all learn together to further develop the services within each of our countries. So that's what we really hope from this project. All right, now since we are reaching the end of our program also, I would like to end off by asking you all to give a positive message or an advice that you all can give for the parents, for the individuals per se who are going through this and also the teachers and also the young people who have friends who have been diagnosed with autism as well because I feel that acceptance plays a major role and how you deal with these kind of people is very important especially for the parents as well and also maybe you can advise on the fact that you know as a, a professor said that the detection can come as early as two, two years old or maybe adolescent age you don't know so is it whether it's important to carry on with these um, treatment or the help that we can do is it too late is it important that we go on? So if you can uh, start, Dr. Dilini. Yeah, so I think the main message I would want to give would be, um, we have our own way of monitoring child development. So if parents can uh, keep an eye on how their child is developing, and if you see the you know suspicion of autism, you know, you have worries about your child's development, seek help ask for a medical opinion and get an early diagnosis. So that will really help to reach out for available interventions. And as Jonathan said, early means best outcomes. Um, the second thing possibly, as I always said, you know, what we really need, whatever the diagnosis and interventions, we want acceptance from the society. We want inclusion and understanding them. So that, that would be my message for the society. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Dilini, you mentioned that it's important for them to seek help. What are the pathways available here in Sri Lanka for parents to reach out? That's important, I feel. Yes, yes, very important question. So uh, in Sri Lanka at the moment, we have, uh, you know, what we call CHDR or Child Health Developmental Record or the blue or pink book you carry from the time you are born. So that book itself has, um, a certain way of monitoring your child's development. So we, you're supposed to look at this at each age point and talk to your public health midwife, your area's midwife who's visiting you. Um, and then if you have any concern at any point, you are supposed to talk to them and then they will direct you to the specialist in the area who would be a pediatrician most of the times and then they will you know signpost you to relevant services all right thank you mrs malathi is there anything you could like to share hope hope is the word that i think uh, i want to share uh, now we as uh, jonathan said early intervention early detection and hoping that sri lanka would accept include and empower these people with autism who sees the world differently. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Kathy. Yes, thank you. I think what I'd like to say is um, not to be scared of difference. So, you know, when we see people who might be behaving or acting in a different way, when we see children who might be doing things that we don't quite understand or we think are unusual, you know, not to be scared by that, not to judge that, but just to try and understand it because people behave in these ways for very 
very good and sensible reasons. So, you know, if we can understand that, we can be more accepting of it. And then that will reduce some of that stigma and some of that judgment, which really impacts upon people's lives. All right. To end off with Professor Jonathan. Yes, I think um, for parents, um, if you have a child who's you suspect or has been um, uh, diagnosed with the condition of autism, I think my message would reflect those of um, my colleagues here, really, is that um, this condition is not uh, a disaster. This condition is something that can be understood. These children are human beings. They're, di they're developing differently to the way you might expect a child to develop. But by understanding the way they're developing, by understanding the way they wish to communicate with you, they have the same needs as any child. And if you can fulfill those and learn how to do that, you will uh, find that they repay that hugely and that they will um, uh, feel much better about themselves and a lot of their difficulties will seem much less than uh, it might have done at the beginning. So hope is, is the message actually, but you can do it if you learn the right kind of techniques to um, value your child. All right, that message, the word hope is, I believe, a very important term because, as I mentioned earlier, I have had um, encountered with parents who are clueless about what are they, they are going to do with their child when they find out that their child has been diagnosed with, this, uh, with autism. So um, my final question, like as I asked earlier as well, is it important, um, is it okay to find the right support at any given time or age once you find out the symptoms? Because uh, people say that, oh, it's important you find out at the early stages as well, then there is a better outcome of it. So, but at you, if you find out at the latter part of life, it's, it's, uh, people do give up. So what advice can you give regarding that? Yes, perhaps I'd say a little thing about that. As a clinician, um, I often meet uh, uh, older children, adolescents and adults who have realized that they have this condition. And to understand that often really is helpful in making sense of their lives and the things they've found difficult, the things that they've felt natural about themselves that they haven't always felt has been understood by others, and that can be really helpful. So if you're an adolescent, for instance, or an adult who thinks you might um, show this kind of uh, developmental condition, then uh, yeah, do reach out and get um, support and understanding and diagnosis for it because actually that'll make a positive difference if you understand yourself better. So. All right, thank you so much again for sharing your experiences and the knowledge that we have. I believe this is important for everyone who is watching this also. And uh, Mrs. Malathi, thank you for sharing your uh, real life experience as well. I believe it's important for the parents who are watching this uh, because we have proof that, you know, this can be done. You can cope up with this and it's not something, you know, unusual and it's something that we all need to accept at this point. So thank you so much. Thank you for the answer. And that was the end of our Gen XYZ episode. We will be back again next week with another topic or issue relating to the youth. In case you couldn't watch us on air, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Stay safe and have a good night.